Hey guys, my name is Impetuous Panda. My name is, is Miguel, even though I'm also known as Mogwai. You know me with uh, Mogwai, we're kind of the European duo over there. Hey, I'm Julian Petrutemka. My name is David Turley, I'm known to the internet as Freak. I do believe Europe is the strongest region. It, it's the Americas overall, as well as uh, Oceania. Southeast Asia and Asia in particular. Every single player here absolutely deserves to be here. America and Asia, you know, not, not trash talking here, but just say that I, I think they're going to have to... You know, they're, they're going to have to put in the work. In general, across the regions, and especially from, you know, Southeast Asia, Asia, the amount of diversity in the metagame is pretty awesome. The metagames almost always evolve differently in different regions. I, said, I see a lot of innovation from Asia. I think they're very creative over there, and they have amazing players there as well. Even from the meta perspective, it's always been a little bit different to, to Europe and to North America, and they, they play different things, they test different things. Lots of these players qualified with some pretty wild decks. When you compare the Americas to sort of Europe in general, uh, that even though these players all came from, uh, you know, four different countries as well, uh, their lineups are so similar. So looking at the EU participants, we have uh, five players that are all uh, very big names. In this case, not really any surprises. I think they have a player base that is the most efficient at like figuring out uh, the meta and essentially finding the best lineup. It definitely seems like uh, in any given social circle, people have kind of congealed on on roughly one strong set of lineups or like one one strong set of decks. I would say if, if there's one like simple way to define like how each meta looks like in every region is um, I see a lot of creativity in Asia. Um, I see a lot of diversity in North America and I see a lot of like refinement from from Europe. There's no amount of luck or, or chance in the world that could get you a spot in the world. It's 100% just skill and, and dedication. That's the most exciting thing about this tournament for me. Just the fact that we're finally going to see all these amazing names added together and there's no walls in between and it's just, we're going to see who the best player actually is in the world and that's, that's super hype.
Hey guys, my name is Impetuous Panda. My name is, is Miguel, even though I'm also known as Mogwai. You know me with uh, Mogwai, we're kind of the European duo over there. Hey, I'm Julian Pechitemka. My name is David Turley, I'm known to the internet as Freak. I do believe Europe is the strongest region. It, it's the Americas overall, as well as uh, Oceania. Southeast Asia and Asia in particular. Every single player here absolutely deserves to be here. America and Asia, you know, not, not trash talking here, but just say that I, I think they're gonna have to you know, they, they're gonna have to put in the work. In general, across the regions, and especially from, you know, Southeast Asia, Asia, the amount of diversity in the metagame is pretty awesome. The metagames almost always evolve differently in different regions. Said, I see a lot of innovation from Asia. I think they're very creative over there, and they have amazing players there as well. Even from the meta perspective, it's always been a little bit different to, to Europe and to North America, and they, they play different things, they test different things. Lots of these players qualified with some pretty wild decks. When you compare the Americas to sort of Europe in general, um, that even though these players all came from, uh, you know, four different countries as well, uh, their lineups are so similar. So looking at the EU participants, we have uh, five players that are all uh, very big names. In this case, not really any surprises. I think they have a player base that is the most efficient at like figuring out uh, the meta and essentially finding the best lineup. It definitely seems like uh, in any given social circle, people have kind of congealed on on roughly one strong set of lineups or like one one strong set of decks. I would say if if there's one like simple way to define like how each meta looks like in every region is 
Um, I see a lot of creativity in Asia. Um, I see a lot of diversity in North America, and I see a lot of like refinement from from Europe. There's no amount of luck or, or chance in the world that could get you a spot in the world. It's 100% at just skill and, and dedication. That's the most exciting thing about this tournament for me, just the fact that. We're finally gonna see all these amazing names added together and there's no walls in between and it's just, we're gonna see who the best player actually is in the world and that's, that's super hype. Players have been competing to be the best in their region. The top 16 have made it into the World Championship in which they'll compete for the title of Legends of Runeterra World Champion. Those top 16 competitors from all over the world are going to battle it out for a piece of the $200,000 prize pool and a shot at becoming the Legends of Runeterra World Champion. The wait is over and the competitors are ready. So stay tuned here with us so you can be the first to find out who becomes the Legends of Runeterra World Champion? Hello everybody and welcome to the final day of the Legends of Runeterra World Championship. My name is Nekra and I'm your host for the last and final day of the competition where we are going to crown who is the World Champion. Let's go ahead and take a look at what the final format is going to look like for, day, for today because we started out days one and two with two group stages where groups A and D played against each other and we also had group C and D perform on day two where we took the top two players from each group after those round robins and we placed them into the top eight bracket. I'm so excited about this because we are playing a single elimination best of three bracket to decide the world champion today. Let's go ahead and take a look at that bracket to show you all of the players that are competing. We have some incredible players at the very end of this with What Am I, Odyssey, Allen, Cosimo, Aikado, Yamato, Shihu, and Realki, who are all going to be battling it out today for that title of world champion. But that's not all. We've got an incredible prizing that these players are also competing for, where we also had 9th through 16th take home a chunk of that prize pool, which is $200,000, but the lion's share is up for grabs today with $40,000 going to the world champion and also this incredible trophy. Let's go ahead and take a look at that again. We know that we have previewed this every single day this weekend, but this is the trophy. This is what that top player is going to be taking home to show off in their wonderful glass case. But you can also, as a viewer, stay tuned today for exclusive emotes. we got the fist bump emote for you, which you know is going to be great to increase your emote game within Legends of Runeterra. But to kick off everything today, we have an incredible special treat for you all where we've got two special guests joining us on the broadcast we've got steve rubin and alex lee from the developer team steve how are you I i'm doing great so excited for today thanks for having us alex what about you yeah it's, it's awesome to be here this morning thanks for thanks for letting us join <clears throat> Well, I want to just start off by allowing you to both introduce yourselves to the Legends of Runeterra community that's tuning in today. Steve, why don't you start? Hi, uh, I'm Steve Rubin, uh, also known as Riot Rubin Zoo. I work as a game designer at Riot Games. Uh, if you play lore, you might know me from being the lead on the champion expansions, both uh, the Aphelios and the Viego Auction champion expansions I was a design lead for. Uh, I also work sometimes on live design uh, alongside Alex. Alex, uh, and yeah, that's that's what I do at Riot, and I'm just so so pumped for these games. Yeah, so I'm Alex, uh, I'm a senior game designer on Lore uh, as well. Um, I was a set lead for Rising Tides, and then I was one of the lead designers for Beyond the Bandlewood, um, as well as yeah, doing a bunch of the live design stuff with Steve. It's awesome to see how both of you have influenced the metagame for Legends of Runeterra, but I really want to ask you about, you know, what the competitive journey for Legends of Runeterra has really looked like from launch to today. Alex, what are kind of your thoughts about how that has developed leading up to the World Championship? 
I, it's been pretty incredible. I would actually step back a little bit and say, like, during dev, we would occasionally do tournaments, you know, just to see how stuff was feeling. And so going from, you know, that to, like, seeing come the, like, homebrew tournaments that have popped up from players to seasonals to this has just been an in, insane journey. Because, you know, I think for a lot of us that worked on it, you can... You can remember the times it was just all of us in the office yelling about what deck was going to be the best. <laughs> uh, and so seeing that realized is, um, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I mean, it's been a long time coming. Uh, Alex mentioned the internal tournaments used to have, like, I, personally, personal memories of Jack Calvi top decking a Karina Veraza against me in a tournament. <laughs> and everybody just two in a row and everybody just losing their, their minds in the office to now at the World Championships. Uh, it is absolutely wild to see, like, our players get into the competition, you know, construct their best lineup in our format and, and go at it for the world championship. That that evolution is something that uh, I think we always believed in lore as a competitive game, and now we're kind of seeing that come to fruition, which is just great. Let's talk about the world championships a little bit more. It's been a three-day event, which has been super exciting to see all of the plays, all of the deck lists. But, you know, Steve, what are kind of your initial thoughts about the world championships and, and what it means for the Legends of Runeterra community? My initial thoughts are, I'm honestly blown away. You know, when I, when I heard we were doing Worlds, I was super excited as a competitive player myself. Um, and just seeing the whole buildup of the sort of seasonal points and the ranked, ranked ladder and then the players that did well at the seasonals themselves all kind of funnel in to the best of the best. Absolutely what, one of the most skill-testing sort of like metas and trajectories I've ever seen in a CCG. Um, so I, I definitely have really really enjoyed that whole year leading up to worlds and then just the top 16 has been so intense so many great games i think yesterday when i saw that like everybody was one-on-one -on -one, and then there was going to just be four <laughs> winning ins in a row to the top oh, yeah. eight uh i was really really proud of of both you know wh what what lore ha has done but what the community has kind of built uh competitive lore into yeah, I mean, I, I would share similar sentiments. It's, uh, it is extremely uh, impressive and amazing to see not only like the structure go, but also just like the refinement from players and the player decks. Um, I think there was a, for us, there was like a lot of excitement over like, what, what decks are players going to bring into the, like, you know, uh, the, re the, the qualifiers and then into like worlds and like seeing just the shift between those is like, it's, it's, it's just been awesome. Why don't we go into that a little bit more? I think the deck diversity of the World Championship has been unmatched so far. And Alex, I'd really love to hear your thoughts about maybe some of the decks you were most excited about seeing in the World Championship. Yeah, I, I will be, uh, yeah. Darkness uh, was one that I think I had no no ideas or hopes for to see in in, uh, in any any list. And that, that popping up, not only that popping up, but also winning has been awesome. Um, uh, the uh, Heimerdinger deck as well. I, like we always kind of enjoy the fifth fan favorites, and for me personally, seeing the like Ezreal Vi Curious Shellfolk deck pop up, uh, and like just seeing it pop off when it has, has been uh, amazing. Um, particularly because like Curious Shellfolk, Curious Shellfolk was a card that we when we designed it was like, oh, this would be like a fun, you know, like someone will want to make this deck and like have a good time with it. And so <laughs> seeing it used skillfully in that way was like a oh uh and it's just been like yeah it's very cool yeah for me i love i love i love the aggro decks uh, i love seeing the uh the players all the Lu the lulus uh, uh, and poppies running around uh seeing a lot of draven scions though it seems to be it seems to be mostly banned so maybe we'll get to see that more today as, as players adapt uh definitely agree with alex that i think we see a lot of like these one-off control decks that are interesting like the uh like the darkness deck that yamada brought or the uh allen's uh curious shell folk deck uh definitely interesting to see now that players have a day or two to kind of look ahead and see oh I i'm gonna be playing against this weird control deck well, uh, i'm super interested to see how that plays out given given the bands you know and the group stage was kind of thrown in it's like oh i need to play against this deck i haven't played against now players have a bit more time to prepare uh so i'm gonna see but really interesting to see how those uh sort of control decks pan out we have seen some incredible deck lineups and also some incredible plays. I mean, Steve, you were just talking about how there, there's that memory of top decks uh, in your history. And so was there anything that has stood out to you about these players' play styles or specific moments that have happened during the World Championship so far? 
Yeah, I mean, the most exciting moment for me was the uh, real key versus badge attack game, where uh, you know it looked it looked so much like badge attack was what was was cu- turning the corner. Uh, real key eventually drew a leviathan for lethal, and uh, you know my boy Akshan had to get in there with the relic of power and the relic uh, or the the fount the fount of power to draw three cards to find the concerted strike to kill that leviathan. I think that's definitely like a, a highlight moment that I'll probably never forget. <laughs> Yeah, I think for me, um, the Allen versus uh, Yamato with the uh, with his darkness deck, like seeing the darkness deck. Sorry, I should say like the darkness deck is always exciting. It's like, can we get there? We all kind of know what it wants to do, and seeing him kind of like uh, play out his options, and then we're we're all kind of relying on that top deck to see if he's going to get there, and him being able to drain tank from like seven back up to seventeen, and then be able to close out the game against you know the Scion Draven deck that was just absolutely pummeling him up until that point was. It was very cool um, and and a, and a nice like you know nail biter moment until he hit that and uh, yeah it's cool. I also really like that we saw some uh, feel the rush kind of come into play for some of those final moments. That was definitely yep. a really cool way to end some of those games. But you know players, play styles, decks, they've all been incredibly diverse, and I know it's really hard to pick a favorite. But I'm going to ask you to do that anyway. So, you know, Alex, for our final question, why don't you uh, tell us maybe who you're rooting for, who you think is going to take it all home? Oh, it's so tough. Um, I, yeah, I think I'm still rooting for Yamato. I think, like, watching him play and just how he's been able to execute on his decks is, is like, really enjoyable. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to see if he can take it all the way. Yeah, for me, my eyes are really on the top of this bracket. I think that, uh, you know, one of my is historically probably the most uh the most experienced tournament player you know i know he plays in a lot of the uh, online league series over the weekends the small tournaments he, he, he's been in the he's been on the saturday sunday stage before in those um so i think that he's definitely a favorite though that that matchup between him and uh odyssey actually who of all the day two competitors i think odyssey pl- definitely played the cleanest i'm super excited for that matchup i know that um odyssey beat Majin Bay, who was playing the same exact lineup as what am I so it's definitely might be a little bit uh, of an interesting matchup going in so excited for that but in terms of so those are my picks to win in terms of who I'm most rooting for it's definitely got to be Alon I think that um you know me and him go way back and I'm just uh, I think that there's something to say for those ladder players who you know some of the haters out there say, saying you know maybe who oh who's <laughs> gonna make it seasonal point turns people champions of the past uh, Alan definitely coming back and proving that he can be, you know, a, a tournament player as well. So I'm super excited to root him on. Well, Steve, Alex, thank you so much for all that you do for the Legends of Runeterra community. And thank you so much for sharing your insights on the broadcast. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Well, uh, that is always so exciting to get a chance to hear from the developers themselves about all of the incredible things happening in the Legends of Runeterra community and specifically with the World Championship that we are going to be concluding today and crowning a a world champion. So I can't wait to get into that. And we're just going to go ahead and start with the games, shall we? Casanova and Swim, welcome on board. We're kicking off the day today with an incredible match. And I am so excited to hear also your thoughts, Cass, about, you know, that developer interview. Yeah, I mean, it's always so much fun to hear from those two. Ruben has actually cast tournaments with me in the past. We used to run an event called Reckoning, and Ruben has cast with me. It's always so fun to talk to him. And Alex designed my two favorite sets, Rising Tides and Beyond the Battlewood. <laughs> so it's it's always cool to hear their thoughts, not only about the game, but about, you know, the players and what they're watching from the developer perspective. And yeah, they shouted out a lot of things that uh, I think I agree with on some of the players who played the best and who might be looking at to win this whole thing. Yeah, I, I mean, I got to say huge props to the developers. I'm going to second what Casanova said. I mean, the Bandle City expansion was my favorite one, hands down, personally. Uh, I mean, it all feels very balanced and very impactful at the same time. But I mean, also props to, you know, the live balance team. I mean, we just had two live balancers there, not just, I mean, basically everyone on the dev team because, um, well, a little bit of backstory. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I tweeted, basically, uh, the game is so perfect right now. You know, the expansion's really good. The meta's so good, but just a couple of nerfs. You know, we're those Merciless Hunter and Ruin Runner nerfs, and the devs came through immediately. And just the fact that those nerfs came through and we were able to have this tournament with the meta that it has absolutely shows their dedication to, you know, keeping the competitive environment as diverse as possible. And we have the best tournament in Rune Terror to date because of it. 
Yeah, I, I mean, talk about the diversity, the player diversity, and everything that we get a chance to see throughout the course of the World Championship. I'm so excited to get into today's games. But before we do that, in case you missed it, let's go over what happened day two. Because there was a ton of action. Groups C and D, just like groups A and B, were completely stacked. So, Cass, why don't you kick us off with what we saw yesterday? Yeah, I mean, we had a lot of crazy games over the course of the day. We started it all out with JLo picking up this insane win over Allen playing the Zoe Nami. Allen had found an insane line where he got a trap that allowed him to play a Scorched Earth on an elusive and had a get excited to follow up the guiding touch. It looked over, but Chelo brought it back. And then, you know, we saw a lot of Americas popping off in the early stages of the yep. day, right? Swim, but it just got turned around as things went on. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're just seeing Odyssey beating Majin Bay here and Yamato uh, beating Cello. And that's kind of like the theme of yesterday was on day one. The Americas did really well. And yesterday, day two, was a really, really good comeback for both Asia and the European regions. And we're seeing right now going into day three, we have basically an even distribution yeah. among all three major regions. Yeah, it's a 3-3-2, right? Three Americas, three Europe, two from Asia almost i mean it is as even as it can get as right with this many it players be, exactly it's 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 the most even as possible a lot of deck diversity as well you're seeing a feel the rush on your screen right now nobody <laughs> can tell me they expected to see a feel the rush going into worlds i don't believe you <laughs> i don't believe you if you say you did we're seeing it from shihu and he's made it to top eight with this list you can see Machin Bay probably not super happy about losing to that list is one he probably never anticipated running into and in shihu with the amazing pop-offs all day Throwing up the raise your dongers for the chat as well, consistently finding those victories with the Heimerdinger list. And there it is. We called it. It's right there. It's right there, Swim. I, lo I love Shihu, Cass. Uh, honestly, so great. As, as much as I have NA bias, and I'm sure you can relate, a large part of me is secretly rooting for Shihu to live. I love that guy, and I mean, he's he's been here from the start. I've known him for over a year now, and his lineup is spice, and it paid off big time yesterday. Really she is just one of our players that's going to be participating in the top eight today. Let's go ahead and show you the players once again or who are going to be competing in the final day of the tournament. I, I mean, this is an incredible list of players. We had so many strong players just leading up to the world championship, but these are the last eight standing. And Swim, why don't you kick it off with uh, who your, maybe your top two favorites are for the tournament? I gotta say, I mean, at this point in time, it's a really, really tough call. My top two picks for this tournament are probably What Am I and Alan, although she who is a close third. Now, that being said, I might be a little bit biased because not only do I have NA bias, but I also have just general Western bias. When we get to Odyssey and Yamato, these are players from Asia that I haven't really had seen play before because mostly I've cast and watched a lot of both NA and EU games. And these are wild cards. They did super well yesterday. What do you think, Casanova? I mean, for me, I got to agree with you with What Am I? He's the only person that went 3-0 in his group. I like his lineup a lot. I think he's been playing really clean. And it seems like he's got some RNG on his side as well. He'd probably <laughs> tell you that himself. So he's looking good in this tournament. And that's for the top half of the bracket. On the bottom side, I want to get a pick from there as well. I'm looking at the matchup between Ikado and Yamato. I think Yamato played some of the cleanest gameplay mm. of anyone yesterday. But I have question marks about the darkness. Ikado yeah. has been on a crazy hot streak over the past month. He's almost undefeated with his Ezreal deck. He is undefeated in this tournament with his Ezreal deck. And I think if he can get through Yamato, I think Ikado has a really good shot of making it all the way. So really for me, I kind of cheating, getting a third pick there. But I think the, <laughs> the winner of that matchup has a really great shot of going to the end. Yeah, and I got to say, I mean, you nailed it perfectly. I completely agree with you. If I had to break down the general kind of themes of these three regions, because that's the fun thing about Worlds. It's all these regions with different play styles, different deck building mentalities, and different strategies kind of merging together. We see the American players brought pretty like standard, kind of like non-risk averse lineups, mm -hmm. like fairly high variance decks, a lot of Zoe Nami, and a lot of just general like high value, like average value decks. The European players go a little bit spicier. We see, you know, Shihu and Allen that brought like very specific kind of targeted lineups that are trying to do pretty spicy things. The Asian players, Yamato and Odyssey, brought, I mean, decks that are a little bit weird, decks that we haven't really seen before, but the one thing we can all agree on is their execution 
is flawless. So we saw so both good. Yamato and Odyssey play almost flawless days yesterday. Like you, you could not spot a mistake that they made, and that's that's insane. Ooh, I, I think they're definitely uh, and hopefully going to be in top form for today because these are the matches that decide it all. Single elimination bracket, top eight players. Uh, what more could you ask for for the final day of Legends of Runeterra World Championships? But let's go ahead and get the action underway. Cass, why don't you intro that first match? All right. Thank you so much, Necra. Our first match of the day is Ooh. gonna be what am i versus odyssey we got the perfect record from yesterday versus some of the perfect play or sorry the perfect record from day one versus yeah. some of the perfect play from yesterday yeah. with odyssey this matchup's gonna be six swim I i'm really looking forward to these two players going at it. i think their lineups are pretty even maybe a slight edge to what am i but it is it's gonna be quite it's a close. match it's very, very close. And you mentioned that, you know, a little bit of an, an, an edge in the lineup goes to what am I? And that's very true. If you're looking lineup to lineup based on the stats, maybe like light edge for what am I? But on the other hand, what am I being kind of like the prep partner and teammate of Majin Bay? They're both on the Mastering Rune Terra team and they both prep together, brought basically the same lineup. And we saw Odyssey smackdown majin yeah. yesterday so you not know. only is what am i playing for his fallen teammate he's not just playing for himself he's playing for majin bay but it's also an effective redemption match because it's against odyssey again and i mean odyssey of course <laughs> is a very very good player yeah yeah and i just want to talk a little bit more about jordan or what am i here he has been such a good staple of the Legends of Runeterra competitive community for so long. He entered the scene, I want to say about eight or nine months ago, as far as tournament play starting, and he was playing some very off-meta things. He was playing Endure months after it had been out of the meta with things like Battle Fury at the top end. He was playing Discard Aggro with Captain Farron's when no one else had that in the deck. He was playing all these aggro lists and popping off in tournament, being so incredibly strong, and then eventually he swaps, he flips the script. He starts playing Triple Targon at every seasonal quality. 9x star shaping, 9x hush, and qualifying for four out of five of the top 32s, playing exceptionally. And since then, now that Targon's been nerfed, he doesn't like aggro anymore. He's like, you know what? I'll just bring the three best decks because I can. I'm one of my. I can play anything. And he's proved it time and time again in the seasonals, in the top 16, going 3-0 in his group. And he's trying to prove it yet again here today against Odyssey. Absolutely. I mean, in the last like several months, Watamai has kind of developed a reputation for himself as like almost a Targon one trick because he just jams yeah. that. And with Targon nerfed, he's not really able to bring Targon, except for, of course, you know, the, the Nami Zoe. <laughs> he's still proving himself, proving that he has the ability to be very adaptive as a player. And, you know, he won't be any more known as a Targon one trick. Then, of course, we get into Odyssey, who's a bit of a mystery card, right? Like, we don't know too much about Odyssey. We haven't seen a lot of these, you know, tournaments, um, but he's coming out of nowhere. And I love that these big tournaments are a great way for players to make names for themselves. Yeah, and Odyssey has done just that already. He's playing exceptionally on his first day. He comes from the Thai scene, which has a lot of amazing players in Southeast Asia with Artifi, who we saw earlier this week, but also players like Kalamidas, who has done incredibly well in tournaments over time. Overall, that whole Thai scene, I know I'm missing a lot of the names of such incredible players there, but he comes from a great region. He's a great player, and he has done it time and time again in this tournament. We're looking at one of my Draven Scion, though. Both these players have this list. This list has been popping off all weekend. It is such a powerful deck swim. Do you want to break it down a little bit more for the people at home? Oh, absolutely. I, I would love to. I mean, the lineups are actually fairly similar lineup to lineup. Both players have dropped Poppy Lulu, or Pop Poppy Lulu. Both players have dropped, brought Draven Scion, but the versions of Draven Scion could not be more different. What am I's version, uh, which has kind of like taken the ladder by storm, is a very, very refined version, or at least, I mean, by, by my eyes, this looks very, very good. Um, it's got the three aloof travelers. It's playing for a kind of like an outgrind sort of game plan, not playing too many one health units with the two poro cannons and the two boom baboons, and is just generally going to outvalue pretty much everything. On the other hand, we see a very unconventional Scion deck from the side of Odyssey. Yeah. It's basically aggro burn melded. He's running decimates, he's running fervors, and it's gonna be really interesting if we get to see these clash if neither of them gets banned out. It's my kind of Scion list swim. You know me, you know I'm known for burn originally, right? That's my kind of deck. I see decimates, I'm like, this is my list. This is the one I love to see. So as much as, you know, 
but I love what am I? He's a good friend of mine. You know, I want this Draven Sion list to show up and I want to see it pop off. I love seeing burn pop off on the big stage. And well, we are casting it. If you've been around the grassroots competitive scene for a long time, I have quite the rep reputation for casting burn matchups. And generally the burn players always high roll when I cast it. So good ban, Jordan, good ban, what am I? All right. You know, you have we, me on the desk. You gotta ban the burn deck. <laughs> we see some very, very standard bans coming out here. Odyssey banning the Zoe Nami. His lineup is pretty vulnerable to it, of course, because, you know, Zoe Nami just being a very powerful deck that Odyssey didn't really build a lineup around. Uh, one of my bans, the Scion, leaving uh, his own Scion up, and Odyssey's is down. Yeah, and uh, I want to point out that one of my deck that he's been least successful with throughout the tournament so far is actually the Zoe Nami. Yeah. So it being banned means that the two decks remaining, out of those two decks, he has lost a single game. It was Poppy, which is three and one. He has been so perfect as far as the match record is concerned outside of the Zoe Nami, which has picked up a couple of losses. And we'll see if what am I can continue that streak against Odyssey, who also had a phenomenal group stage. I gotta say, Casanova, I'm 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 getting shivers. I am so <laughs> excited to watch this because I mean it really is effectively a a rematch, right? A spiritual rematch. This is the match yeah. that Majin. I'm sure Majin is in chat right now, cheering on his teammate. What am I to be able to beat Odyssey? Yeah, what am I's got the spirit of Majin and the rest of the <laughs> Mastering Runeterra team that couldn't make it to the top eight behind him. It's the, the spirits of his ancestors ready to go and fight this one out. He's got the double Bandle City Mayor ready to go for this opener. It's incredibly strong and this deck from Odyssey does not have a lot of removal. So what am I is gonna start to be able to pop off if he can get these on board, but Odyssey, of course, being able to go pretty wide, getting a very bad miss on that Mirai Warden though, hitting the prey. Yeah, the Prey is really, really awkward. Normally, I mean, this tends to be a bit of a favorable matchup for the burn deck for Odyssey here. Um, and his hand is solid, but the Prey is going to slow him down a little bit as we see a potentially disgusting hand off the side of What Am I. I mean, you can see the double mayor hand, and it's just going to have a lot of value. These Owl Cats are going to be zero mana, and this board is permanently flooded. Yeah, part of me actually would love to see the aloof picked up and we do get it from what am I when you're playing against this burn deck most of their deck is very small but the things that are going to kill you or finish you are going to be those top ends so aloof if you can snipe things like the double up and the gangplank is incredibly important for protecting your life total and allowing you enough time to get this rally down and close out the game so we'll probably see what am i try and play this aloof before we get to turn five and a gangplank gets allowed to be slammed it's gonna be hard because you can't play it with the mayor so what am i is going to leave up an opportunity where odyssey might be able to slam this gp on five with the attack token yep. and he's thinking about second aloof and he actually yeah. goes for it. it what am i a big proponent of aloof travelers as a card remember his draven sound version was running three he thinks the card is actually just straight broken and casanova i completely agree with what you said i mean your breakdown was perfect against burn even though you know normal aggro you would just want to stabilize early against burn you have to discard their top end because it's going to blow you out we can see the double up we can see the gangplank and they might get discarded next turn yeah, I mean, if Odyssey doesn't lead with a Gangplank, I actually think What Am I is incredibly favored in this game. Yes. And I don't think it's always correct on your turn five attack token to lead with a GP, but I do wonder if Aloof Travelers is in the back of Odyssey's mind and he knows, okay, well, I do need to make sure that I get my top end down. My strongest cards need to hit the board so I can push this last 11 damage because yes, impact is good, but is a Tenor of Terror and a Stone Stackers going to cut it when you're going up a on it? on a deck that has so much explosive damage with the rallies once they gain board control exactly that's the thing i mean burn you know you, you conventionally see burn as like an aggro deck but if anything i mean what am i is kind of the aggressor here burn is an aggro deck that slows down its pace it's proactive but it plays for inevitability rather than speed right what am i is going to try to race him down and honestly with a hand like this especially with the rally it looks like he might be successful yeah i mean he's gonna be able to do so the matter is does odyssey have enough damage to get through before that happens right there's 11 health on what am i and we see double up and gangplank these are two of the best cards for odyssey to be able to push that damage does he have time to get them down or is he gonna get aloofed because if he gets aloofed this game's just done right so i like yeah. how does he win if he gets both of these aloofed it's gonna be tough the lecturing yordles are really good 
but one of my has the rally we br you brought it up already the rally is sitting there it's ready to go yeah and i mean this full board with this full white attack with these two battle city mares i mean the aloof travelers being two mana three fours that discard those win conditions what am i is looking in a very very good position odyssey might need some good puff cap uh puff cap luck on the draws to be able to do well here he does know it of, of course with this attack he knows to expect a ranger's resolve but he still does have to block the force it and stop the damage yeah and uh Ooh. what am i is like okay i don't need this lulu gonna hold up the ranger's resolve he needs board space anyways uh yeah for and this is aloof basically a play that he's worried about a one health lulu dying to a red card or a make it rain obviously we can see there's not an odyssey sands or she could die, die to a puff cap dart but basically he's not gonna use a resource keeping a one health unit alive which in this case you know we can see there's there's no resource uh, that odyssey has that would counter it but he could have one and he could draw one yeah, it absolutely could happen. I mean, this is a deck called Ping City for a reason. <laughs> it's it's very Ping good City. at dealing one damage. So uh, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Let's not leave any one health units around, but the aloof gets to come out because it was a tenor and goodbye There's game blank. blank. And guess what? Another here. one gets to come down and potentially get rid of the double up. So Odyssey's gonna have to win with this small stuff. Now the hidden pathways is gonna be a big draw because that's gonna allow him to look for more of that top end, more of these strong cards, but what am I has a good opportunity to get rid of all the scariest things and leave Odyssey with a bunch of low cost pings. Yep, exactly. A pretty perfect block by what am I just reducing his health down to nine off the impact. Dart sends him to eight, and this is a game of punches. Odyssey is here counting the numbers. Yep. Dart goes to eight. Double up could potentially go to four. Uh, the, pu the puff, puff cap just hit, and there's another double up. It got okay. discarded immediately off of the aloof. But Odyssey has another one. That's four potential damage. Ranger's Resolve can try and stop it, but it can't save the, the danger noodle from dying. That's a 1-1. One, one. Man, this is actually going to be so close. What am I needs to dodge these puff caps so badly? He doesn't draw one on this one. Can he win this turn if he can set up a good double attack? He doesn't Ooh. have Lulu or Poppy, and Odyssey's at 17, so he might be out of lethal range. Yeah, the board's just too small. Like, like you said, no Poppy, no Lulu. The champions that provide the biggest amount of damage are not here for what am I. So even if he does get the two attacks in with the rally, all it probably does is set him up to win on a third attack. But this is his token. That's full two turns away from actually finishing this game. I mean, I haven't been able to calculate this out, but I think Odyssey has enough to get the chump blockers down and has some spells like Pokey Stick will be able to stop something. I guess maybe not through Ranger's Resolve, but he's got some capacity to defend himself. That's exactly right. And I mean, we can also see what am I has no protection apart from Ranger's Resolve in his hand for double up. So all Odyssey has to do is play around Ranger's Resolve, cast double up on a one health unit, which means what am I knows that he might be in a situation where he actually tries to trade off his one health units. The tracker won't die because of the bright steel's barrier, but Odyssey, if anything, wants to keep these one health units alive for the double up. Okay, I expect we just see this attack. And I wonder if what am I even does the rally this turn or if he tries to see if he can hit something like a Poppy or a Lulu on the next and entirely play for that. But he doesn't even try and kill off his Serpent. He went for the 0-1 first. That to me indicates a rally. Yep. Odyssey thinking about taking the Pokey Stick Ooh. on the tracker. He knows the snake is surviving anyway. And this is basically a play that says, I don't want to let a rally happen. I know that if this tracker stays on the board, it could be a problem. Uh, and of course the pokey stick used now the reason he's thinking about it now is because barrier procs before tough so by using the pokey stick before this combat resolves it will take off the barrier even if what am i cast rangers resolve right now and the rangers resolve will not protect the tracker from the marai warden so using it now make sure the tracker dies no matter what odyssey's oh. planning to stall and he's got to make it rain he found a make it rain that can be very impactful but i don't know it might not be enough he can't actually play a unit to block i think yeah. he's actually dead swim there's I think the challenge that's it. He can make it rain if it here. I mean, snake the maybe rain doesn't quite do enough. He tried to it doesn't. stop as much damage as possible, but the rally is just too much. He's not able to stop this. What am I going to grab game one over Odyssey in a matchup that, like you were saying, is one that Odyssey could find winnable? This is just going to get harder and harder because now he has to beat Draven Scion twice. Yeah. Oh. Really unfortunate thing there was the Mirai Wardens. Odyssey just got two basically useless units off the Mirai Wardens, and because they weren't able to trade down, you can see he's not super pleased about that on his face because the Mirai Wardens, you know, the summoned units were just able to just die for free. They weren't able to force any exchanges. What am I just ended up with too big of a board? 
Yeah, it, it, he just got too wide, the Elus denying a lot of the big things, but at the end of the day, the Elus didn't really matter as much for the discards as they did for the bodies. Three fours are so good against Pink City because that toughness is high enough that not only can you deal with other of the attackers from Odyssey, but you're also going to survive the pings afterwards. There's too many two power attackers that still leave them as three twos, allowing them to survive everything. The Aloof Travelers works well in so many different ways in that matchup. And that's exactly right. We're going to see what am I on his other deck. And this is another three of Aloof Traveler's deck as he goes to his version of Aloof Scion Odyssey staying on the burn. This is a matchup that's conventionally pretty close to even. Um, but what am I? A slower version of Scion might find himself a little bit unfavored. Yeah, Unless he the Aloofs just bail him out again. He might have a tough time early on, but we see he was able to find one drops, including Draven's biggest fan, which means he will have that turn three Draven. And because of that, I think that that should be enough tools early on to stabilize. The problem is if Odyssey continues to have that onslaught and put on the pressure and one of my runs out of resources, because at least his start is good and it just got better because he's going turn one, Draven's biggest fan, turn two, discarding Lost Soul, turn three, play Draven, turn four, play Revenant. This is an incredibly good curve for one of my. Exactly. And that's why what am I's version is running two of the Draven biggest fan a card that a lot of people were running at the start a lot of people cut down to one of a lot of people cut completely what am i is running two and the reason for this is because in his philosophy oh the scion draven deck is just if you play draven on three and scion on seven you're just good yeah you win <laughs> you should just win the game it's, it's like it's how this deck has been playing and right. it's why this deck is so powerful it's like draven on three scion on seven that game is done it's why aloof is so scary for this deck because even though scion gives you like an upgrade when he gets discarded if you lose your scion for seven you might lose the game. We saw it happen to Majin. Exactly. And I mean, you might say, well, Lost Soul in the mirror match, you know, box the Aloof Travelers. But if you're a good player in the mirror match, you wait until their Lost Soul is discarded and you hit their sign yep. with Aloof. It's a really, really powerful mirror tech. And that's part of the reason why one of my feels so favored here going into this. He just needs to win one of these next two. Yeah, he's got to feel great. And we see him pick up two burn spells. This is not only going to be a threat towards Odyssey's face to counter burn, but they also allow him to remove a myriad of threats that come down. The Tenor of Terror is one of the scariest cards in Ping City for dealing damage to your face, and Mystic Shot plus Get Excited completely removes that card for just one extra mana. Yes, it's extra cards utilized, but if you do remove this, you're setting yourself up to be in such a good position as things go forward. Yep, that's exactly right. I mean, right now, Odyssey is just on the beatdown game plan. He's trying to uh, deal as much damage as fast as possible because he's on a clock. What am I? When turn seven hits, Odyssey knows that that Scion is coming down. What am I is on the odds attack token and Scion might just close out the game. Basically Ooh, that turn, especially card. with what am I's burn heavy hand. Okay, I like gold card here because you're just trying to push as much damage as possible and the stun onto the Draven will allow that. You also have this pokey stick back up. Mm. So you can remove the Draven later if you want to, or you can you might draw into a make it rain, right? There's a lot of different opportunities. King City, again, we we've mentioned it, right? It, it it does one damage really well. The answer is just the twin blade revenant. So he's just gonna go for one block. He could have played two spells, but I think what am I realizes, hey, this isn't that much damage yet. I can afford to do this and then we'll look to use these spells on a bigger threat yep that's exactly right and unfortunately not able to play the tenor of terror this turn otherwise pushing a lot more damage okay another mystic shot picked up for what am i this removal is going to be very nice he can just utilize the twin blade revenant first try and pick off the tf now odyssey has a decision to make do you protect this twisted fate with the pokey stick or you just kill the Draven, let both things die, and start to refill the board. Looks like that's the uh, the latter will be the answer for Odyssey. Yep. And Odyssey in a hand state where he kind of wanted to potentially keep the TF alive because with the hidden pathways in hand, it had the potential for flip. What am I taking it down? There's a bit of an interesting balance with that deck because sometimes you want your TF to die so you can use a second TF. But Odyssey, without second TF, with the hidden pathways, wanted to try to protect it. And what am I went ahead and called that killing it off. All right, we see another chemist come down and now it's going to be the boom baboon or what am i he has plenty of ways to discard use the discard benefited cards in hand we are just going to see potentially the mystic shot onto the base of burden what am i really does not want to leave these alive uh for uh any time he doesn't want to let their attacks in we might not even see the tenor get an attack in either we might see a spell to deal with it on the next turn so, I mean, Odyssey looking 
pretty good here he does need to be able to put a lot of pressure down but his board is fairly stacked the one thing that could make a big difference here is if odyssey is able to draw into over the top some spell some burn spell uh, i'm gonna double up even even a yordle that summons the puff caps like the the hidden pathways here is gonna be so crucial those draws for his ability to close out this game yeah i mean i feel like lecturing yordle has been the mvp of ping city all tournament and Odyssey not having one in this game for turn four, I think is hurting him quite a bit. You would see what am I at a much lower life total. And instead we're gonna get this gangplank down. I feel like what am I needs to deal with this quickly. And the best way does feel like it's gonna be a get excited plus a mystic shot. That is a lot of commitment going in to the gangplank. I, the blocks are okay though, right Swim? If we get rid of this gangplank with the uh, get excited and the mystic shot, we get the, uh, the flame chompers on board and we give it an axe it can block something else and we boom boom into the tenor and it feels like a pretty clean board wipe where you're taking about two damage yeah and i mean i think you might have to go for it here you know odyssey's not gonna have much of a counter response at two mana what am i is thinking about it he's covering his mouth he's like oh man do i go in for it do i double get excited this gangplank when the attack happens do i just like stop that overwhelm damage completely stop the next attack because what am i does know there's gonna be a turn after this we're on turn six odyssey's attack what am i gonna get one attack with scion on turn seven it's gonna be leveled and it's a lot of pressure but he's gonna have to survive odyssey's turn eight and he's thinking that far ahead he knows that the get excited on the gangplank might be necessary taking the poro cannon first oh Looks just like to get another blocker, blocker that allows him to play still get excited and mystic this is so smart all right he has the flexibility he can block down basically the entire board this was the way to avoid the most damage this is such a good play yeah because gangplank can't level on the stack mystic shot and the get excited just taking him down right away and what am i is gonna take just one damage here from this impact oh i had him taking three with the line that i was looking at and the the poro cannon that he drew off the rummage he found this play because he knew he had enough mana to do this he rummaged first to see if there was a better way to do it and yes. he prevented an additional two damage and as crazy as swim and i are getting over two damage when you're against pinks that matters so much it would not be a surprise to see what am i live on two health against this deck even with this scion coming down there is one more aggressive turn for odyssey and what am i is not wide with this play he is just a scion yep he knows that what what am i knows that to be able to represent the clock you need against that burn deck you're gonna have to go in aggressively receive the hidden path into the the, the, the twist of fate and odyssey it. has the gold card now if he wants he can just stun it but i think odyssey is considering if he can do more damage if he can find a way to push more is stone stackers plus make it rain going to be a better line than just stunning this scion is that this going is to so allow close. Odyssey to go around? It's 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 a really tough position because yes, you think immediately like, oh, I should stop this 10-6 overwhelm from charging at my face. But is that actually the winning line is the question? Exactly. Or can Odyssey squeeze out more damage and potentially end the game on the next turn with say a red card trying to get around? If he gets lucky i mean it's so close and that's what he's tanking over right now he knows that this gold card is getting buffed up the keg he knows it's dealing three damage he knows if he does this now the silent doesn't get to attack this turn but he will have to attack on turn eight to be able to represent pressure and what am i has a blocking sign at that point i mean the silent dying rallies and it's scary too i think he's he going for the draw so this is less damage but it buys him more time yeah he goes gold card which like you said that's such a it tough buys call. time but it is slower when pushing on to what am i so what am i is now going to have a way to try and answer but there is at least an open attack that what am i has to contend with and it's still a decent amount of damage the problem is is it's not ending the game and you just exactly. picked up a lecturing yordle so you might want to develop which is a Yordle's scary good. prospect I think at this point in time, what Odyssey is thinking with that play, with a gold card there, what I would be thinking is, I hope there's no second Scion, because if we kill the Scion here, the Scion will die, it will rally, it will hit for 10 on the Scion return, but if there's no second one, I can survive one more attack and potentially get lethal the turn after. We can see the second Scion in Watamai's hand though, of course, and if that's coming down, if this is a rally here on defense, on the blocking Scion, and another Scion on turn nine, next turn with Watamai's attack, then Odyssey, I don't think he can win. Yeah, the attack a got damage. a little awkward, right? Because Scion can block the lecturing Yordle, it dies, it rallies, and this Twin Blade Revenant can block and still look for a swing afterwards. Odyssey will not have the priority back to use the dart. Yes, he has the make it rain, we know that, but it's still is a, an aggressive attack that can come through from what am i to continue to remove the board put the pressure and then redevelop silent 
exactly honestly he's thinking about this attack here he knows if he attacks right now he doesn't get the stone stackers he's thinking about the odds of a unit blocking he knows that daring poro is there the reason he takes this attack now is because i think he wants to make sure the make it rain will hit nexus right now what am i has two units on board by attacking now he's locking him out of another action for a third unit and this make it rain hits the nexus every time and that's pretty important every every single, single damage point of damage matters let's go swim it all <laughs> matters you remember and I that are on two the same from earlier. wavelength, Casanova. Remember that two from earlier, Swim, because I think it's going to come up as oh, we yeah. get to the end of the line of this game. Jordan is at 10, and there are two darts in Odyssey's hand to make it rain for extra damage. We actually see what am I considering this get excited on the stack to stop two more damage. Yep. Just trying to stop as much damage as possible. The Corsair and the ping is going to go through here. One of my goes down to eight, two darts and a make it rain, puts him down to five with puff caps. And he's rallying this turn with a second scion in hand. I don't know how is Odyssey going to survive the second scion attack. That's the, that is the terrifying thing is can Odyssey survive that? Or can he be bailed out by shrooms? Is enough damage going to go through? We have two right now. That's down to eight, two more of the darts. That's going to be going down even further to make it rain. That takes us down to five. How many puff caps are going to be in the deck? How many are going to be drawn? What is going to be the top deck? Can Hidden Pathways find more burn? I mean, this is so, so close. Right now, Odyssey is looking like he's alive. We can look. The Silent Return is going to be 10 Overwhelm. The Daring Poro will come out here on the Rally. And right now, Odyssey does have the ability to block the Silent Return. So he's only taking a total of nine damage. Right now, Odyssey going to slow play it. He's okay. stopping the Poro. He's playing around second Scion, trying to starve out for value. And the Hidden Pathways in hand, I love this play. Okay, Swim, we have to have think to about that one. one damage, though. Oh, my God. Add that damage to the Tally because... If that doesn't buy him another turn, then that was one wasted damage. Oh, it was this, one damage that did not go face. He has to block this right now. He's playing around second scion. He's thinking, do I is the second scion in one of my hand? He blocks. He's calling the second scion, and now he can actually survive the second scion's attack. We know yeah. there's no more burn in one of my hand. Yes, yeah, stone huge. stackers can block it. Stone stackers he wants can the stop the He's damage into shrooms. That block was amazing. <laughs> the Mystic, the Mystic shot. shot, though. The Mystic Shot gets picked up. Is that that's exact? He that's needs exact. to draw something off of Pathways. The Electric is enough that's to block. HP. That's more no HP. Way. The he Stone the Stackers. Is, the stackers. Oh, the Mystic Shot is actually going to it's stop exact. this. Sion is dealing seven off of this, and the Mystic Shot can clean it up. It's exactly lethal. Oh no! Electric oh. Yordle could have saved it. He played around Second Sion for so long. It was so close. He played around so it until close. the last turn. Until the very last turn, he played around it. Oh, Odyssey! Odyssey that was almost such did it! A close game. What am I taking it and advancing? What am I finds the 2-0, oh, but Odyssey, he played 99% of a perfect game. That was so close. Every single play he made was so, so clean. He had a shot, and there is definitely a call to not play on a Mystic Shot and go in more aggressive with Yordle, because yeah. you've got the kill guaranteed if you do that. It's so, so close, but just getting blown out by the top deck Mystic Shot at the last second. Top deck's coming in clutch. We've seen that happen all tournament, I feel like, and another one happening here. Wow. I, I mean, it just looks so back and forth at the end there <laughs> until the top deck happens, Swim. Yeah. No, and both top decks, the Lecturing Yordle too, and the Mystic Shot. I mean, I, I, I can tell you, I had no idea who was going to win until that top deck. Oh. Casanova, did you know? No, no, because he, he had the stones. He played flawlessly around second Sion. I'm so, like, flustered and hyped. I, I just can't. Like, he played so perfectly around second scion nobody does that nobody plays like that they play for the damage to try and do enough but he played conservatively until the last play in odyssey oh my god it, it, it's it sucks to lose him but we're going to be losing amazing players every single game in this top eight everyone's going to be a banger yep. yeah and absolutely. i mean i just gotta say big congratulations for you know what am i to advance on and i'm sure his teammate majin is head banging right now with joy the revenge. Yeah, the revenge the revenge on odyssey who eliminated his teammate earlier absolutely i mean let's go ahead and just pull up the bracket uh, right now what am i going to be advancing into the semi-finals after an incredible 2-0 over odyssey obviously it is it is hard to, to send some of these players home but only one will be standing in the end. I, I mean, we have so many more incredible matches heading everybody's way. So I think for now, 
Casanova and Swim, we're going to say goodbye to you, and we will see you a little bit later.